Hi guys, how are you? Oh my God, I'm happy today, I have to say. Um, so I'm here with a great art. I love his work. I love everything he, he made. So I, uh, he made the best Tars run, I, I think, and everything and everybody says the same. Uh, he was the responsible by working with, here it is, uh, Orion with, from Jackie Kirby's universe. And that's, that's sure. very nice. Uh, he made his Zoltaro comic, Ragnarok. I'm pronouncing right? That's yeah. right. Okay. That's right. Ragnarok. I can't believe I, I'm, I'm with this legend at my Zoom meeting, Mr. Walter Simonson. How are you, sir? I'm very well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, the pleasure is all mine. So, sir, for who don't know you, who are you? Can you, can you say uh, when you started to making comics to who don't you? I, I think that everybody knows you, but... Uh, I, uh, I, I got into comics professionally this coming August 1st, it'll be 50 years oh, nice. <clears throat> since I got in. The, I came in New York in 1972. Okay. Um, at that time, uh, there was no internet. There was no, there were no faxes. Um, so pretty much if you wanted to do comics, you had to come to New York and be there. Yeah. uh in order to bring in your work some of the older professionals could live further away and could mail their stuff in but most of us who were young who wanted to do comics had to live somewhere in the new york city area and go into the office and deliver your pages and uh physically uh, be there so i moved to new york in the uh, beginning of august in 1972 um i was lucky in that i was able to get work pretty rapidly um I barely, I, I, it wasn't like a lot of money. Okay. I think the first year I was in comics, I made $3,000, which okay. would be more then than it is now, but yeah. it still wasn't very much money, but I was able to pay my rent and I was able to buy food. Yeah. I didn't save any money, but that's, <laughs> but that was where I started. Yeah. Um, and I, uh, I, most of my early work, well, my early work was either for DC comics Yeah. Uh, they were doing books that I, I liked at that time. I had read Marvel comics in the 60s, and those were my favorite comics. But by the early 70s, Marvels were not as interesting to me as some of the stuff DC was trying. These, the books at DC, many of them didn't last very long, but they were like Enemy Ace by Joe Kubert and uh, work by Steve Ditko, The Creeper. Um, there were several other titles they were trying out. Uh, and I, it was interesting. It was experimental uh, for the time. And so I went to D.C. to try to get work. Um, I began by doing little backup stories back then. Not so much now, but back then, uh, a number of comics, especially the war titles, yeah. Star Spangled War and Easy Company, Sergeant Rock, had backups in them. And they were like little short stories, anywhere from three to six pages. You could, if you were starting out, they could give you a six page story be in the back of the comic. And if you screwed it up, it wouldn't affect the whole comic. Yeah. You'd have a good story in the front by a yeah. Joe Kubert or a Russ Matt Heath yeah, nice. or an Alex yeah. Toth. Um, but you could learn your craft so you could get paid enough to keep an apartment, feed yourself and do the work. And so the idea or the way it worked out was you learned by doing how to do comics. Yeah. And that was how I began, really. I, I Before that, um, I mean, I'd always drawn pictures. Uh, I hadn't really thought about getting into comics yeah, until okay. I was probably, oh, I don't know, 20, 21, maybe 22, uh, before I thought about doing comics as a profession. Before that, I had wanted to be a paleontologist and study dinosaurs. Uh, and I, I went to school to get a degree in geology and then yeah. move into paleontology as a graduate study. But I, I decided at the end of my senior year not to do that. And okay. I didn't have any other, I didn't have any real plans, but I did go back. I, I had always drawn pictures. So I went to art school. I went back to college. Yeah. I like college so much. I went twice. So I, I went once in geology and I went to art school for three years. I graduated. And while I was in art school, Uh, I still, I was reading comics all this time, Marvel okay. comics. This is the mid to late 60s. So Marvel comics and then DC comics 
anything that was coming out and uh, decided that's what I wanted to try to do. So I put together a portfolio in art school of comic book work that I wrote, penciled, inked, and lettered. And I took that to New York as my portfolio. And I really, by a matter partly of luck and the help of a couple of people, yeah. uh, I was able to get, get some early work and enough and I could get another job after that and then another job after that very slowly, but it was enough to keep me going. Okay. And um, that's how I got into comics. That's really, I, I had the amazingly good fortune to do several jobs for the late Archie Goodwin. Yeah. who was an editor at DC, an editor at Marvel at one time, an editor at Warren, one of the best guys to ever do comics. He was a, a really good cartoonist, a brand cartoonist, yeah. and a phenomenal writer, as well as a great editor. And Archie, after I'd done a couple of jobs for him, liked my work enough and kept feeding me a job here and a job there. And eventually, six months after I'd come to New York, he offered me work on a book, on a feature rather, called Manhunter which was the backup story for detective comics. The lead, so he began editing detective. The lead story was Batman. And he wanted to do a new backup story, a new character called Manhunter, who would be kind of antithetical to Batman, where Batman would be dark and brooding and, oh, and in the city, urban, an urban character. Manhunter traveled around the world. He had a bright red costume and um, was more kind of out of a mercenary background in a way where Batman really didn't use weapons other than like the Batarang, maybe. Yeah. Uh, Manhunter was a weapons expert. Uh, he had a Mauser. He had a, a, a dagger called a Katar or Katar. I'm not sure how it's pronounced. Yeah. And uh, uh, that work ran for about a year. It was uh, eight pages every two months, okay. which I could barely do. And uh, it, it, it did well. I mean, it had a good reputation. Back then, fandom was not what it is now. Like, I wouldn't be talking to you 50 years ago. Yeah. There wasn't that. There were fans. There were comic fans. But they weren't organized the way comic fans are now. There were very few conventions, no comic book shops. So what happened with that book is, I don't know what fans at the time thought of it, although it has a good reputation now. But a number of... When I started that book, except for my few friends in comics, nobody knew who I was. Okay. And when I finished it a little over a year later, a lot of people knew who I was. We won okay. some awards with a comic and editors knew who I was. And after that, I did not have to go looking for work. Okay. I was offered work by yeah. various editors. And it was that was my break, really, was to have Archie offer me this new strip he was doing. And... Uh, it it was a uh, it was my my serious entry into comic books. Perfect, perfect. And your uh, you you say that you lived the the uh, geology uh, high school right high school no uh, college. university yeah college. Yep. So, uh, but we can see that you still loves dinosaurs. We can I see do that. and and huge dinosaur behind you. I, I, I yes, just... there is. That was that was actually a present from my friend John Byrne. No, oh. wait. Oh, now I'm not sure. I do have a dinosaur from John. I think this may be from John. Okay. Now I'm not. It was a while back now, and I'm not sure. And there's actually a button. If it's a Triceratops, if I press the button, the mouth will open and it will roar, even though it's a skeleton. <laughs> oh, that, that's nice. Uh, I, 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 it's, it's very important to say now because uh, you and John Byrne are together always, right? Uh, a lot of videos that I, when I was searching about you to, to this interview, uh, when when I search your name in in, in in YouTube, it's you and John Byrne and and you and Louise. So that's that's very nice. I, John, if you're watching, I love your work too. Uh, I want you for here. So it, it's very nice. When this this friendship starts? Oh, we did uh, well. I've known John. I've known each other since probably the mid '70s. Since whenever he got into comics, he got okay. in a few years after I did. As John never fails to remind me, he's younger than I am by a few years. Um, okay. <laughs> but he got into comics. He did some work at Charlton. I don't know what else before that, if anything. And I don't think I saw his Charlton work at the time. I've seen it since. But it wasn't until he came to work at Marvel that I began to see his work. Um, and 
I don't know the first interaction that we had. Uh, the one first one I can remember, which is kind of ironic, and John has forgiven me for it because it wasn't really my fault. Okay. But um, there was a cover for that John penciled for one of Marvel's combination books, Marvel two and one, or there was a second one, I forget which. Uh, one of the books would be a Spider-Man and a guest star. And one of the book was The Thing and a guest star. And this was for the book that was The Thing. Um, the bad guy, oh, I, maybe it was the, I don't know who that bad guy was. Red, probably not the Red Ghost. I don't remember who it was, but somebody had gotten a hold of the Cosmic Cube. And the, uh, I think um, maybe Swamp Thing was in the middle of it. It's been a long time. Yeah. But they gave me the cover to ink. And I, I don't know that I spoke to John about it at the time, but they wanted me to change a couple of things in the drawing, okay. uh, make a guy look angrier and a, a couple of things like that. So I did ink it. I did change the stuff. Okay. I don't know if I would do that now. Well, now on John's stuff, I certainly wouldn't. Yeah. But, but that's where we first really interacted and uh, became friends afterwards. Um, we never... John didn't, we didn't live in the same area in the city. Okay. So I would, you know, it was the way most freelancers were. You would see people in the office. So okay. when you took your pages in, um, either to Marvel or DC, it was mostly Marvel, mostly DC, the two companies I worked for back then, um, you would see a lot of the young guys. Uh, the first day I, counted, got, I came to New York, when I went to DC to show my portfolio to editors, I went back in the coffee room when I was taking a break and... Howard Chaikin, Bernie Wrightson, oh, nice. Michael Kaluta, and a fourth guy that was either Alan Weiss or Dan Green. I'm not sure which at this point, okay. but the four of them were sitting at a table in the coffee room. And I had met Howard maybe a year earlier at a convention in Washington, D.C., so I kind of knew him a little bit. Introduced myself, you know, I was a guy looking to get into comics. And, and so you could go in yeah. with your work, and you would you never knew who you were going to bump into. Okay. Um, and it really made it was very exciting because you would see the work that Bernie was doing, or the work Howard was doing, or the work Michael was doing, or the I, I I've told the story before, but one of the things, one of the biggest thrills for me was that pretty early in my career, I think at first the first half year I was in the business, um, I was up at DC one day and a, a job called Burma Sky came into the office from Alex Toth that Archie had written for him. And it was just a magnificent job. It was just fabulous. And so you could actually hold the originals in your hand and look at the kind of dry brush work that Alex had done with markers and how he had put it together. And it was really, it was just stunning. And that was one of the best parts about when comics before the web and before faxing, where you could go into the office and you would see work, you know, you'd see Joe Kubert Tarzan pages, no, or you would see, he wasn't living on the West Coast by then, but you would see Jack Kirby stuff go by. Um, there were, or just, I mean, anybody really who was doing mainstream comics. And that was, it was very exciting. It was very inspiring. Okay. Um, and so it was a great time to be doing comic books at that, at that in the seventies, really. Yeah, I, I, I would ask you to, because, um, the, you you can uh, in in that time you you went to the office and you were with the people right we, you were with John Byrne and with you, sure. you saw Jack Kirby so that that's crazy uh, do do you prefer today that you don't need to do being there or you really miss it you know you... well I miss I miss those interactions okay. I uh, uh, you know. I'm old enough now. I don't live in the city anymore. Okay. So driving into the city and parking my car is kind of a pain in the neck. Yeah. And I, I it's like, yeah. And because of the other thing is that because of, well, because of COVID, the offices have really shut down in, in a, in a large part. So the world I'm describing where you go in, you see people that doesn't really exist anymore. Yeah. Um, and even before COVID. That's sad. Most people had moved out of the city. Um, you know, I knew per personally, probably almost everybody in my generation in comics, the Jim Starlins, the Steve yeah. Ungerharts, the Alan Weisses, the Bernies, the Howards, um, 
uh, you know, Steve Skates. There were, you know, dozens and dozens. Terry Austin, Bob Wachek. Um, you know, I became friends with a number of them, uh, good friends with some of them. And they're still good friends. I don't see them very often, mostly, especially in the COVID era. But, yeah. uh, but we're all living in different places. And because you can live somewhere else now and send your work in remotely, yeah. you know, yeah. you scan it. You send in the scan on the internet of the yeah, artwork yeah. or the script, and uh, you don't have to meet these people. So I'm not sure. You'll have to ask some younger guy what it's like doing comics now, yeah. because my impression is there are little clusters of professionals in different places. Up near Woodstock, New York, which is about, I don't know, 80, 90 miles north of us, there are a handful of professionals who live up there, um, Todd DeZego, Terry Austin. Joe Sinnott lived up there when he was still alive. He was near that area. Um, Dan Green. Uh, there are guys who live in the Chicago area. There are guys who live out in San Diego, out in the Los Angeles area, up in the Bay Area of San Francisco. So there are still places where there are professionals kind of clustered, but no one place where everybody yeah. is there at the same time. Yeah. And I, I miss that because it was so inspiring. Um I told this too. I we walked in early in my career, very early in my career. Uh, I walked in into the coffee room at DC. Bernie had been working on Swamp Thing at that time with Len Wein for several issues. Yeah. And he brought some pages from it, and he brought in a page of a, a full page interior splash of a from a werewolf story, a werewolf versus Swamp Thing. Right. And it's a full page splash, and it's the werewolf standing in the middle of the floor of this cabin, and he's all covered in zipatone or whatever, and he's there's a head, you know, guy looking at him and freaking out. And uh, it was great. It was this great page. Yeah. Um, I, and I, and just, it, it was so inspiring to see stuff like that because you would think, oh, crap. Now I got to go home and get better. <laughs> so yeah. that was very inspiring. In fact, one thing was very funny when I, uh, when they first really began doing uh, scanning and having artists send their work in by scan, uh, DC set up a an FTP, a fast transfer protocol, whatever they're called, uh, site, and they had you could, you would be given a password. You could go on it, and they had all these folders, one okay. for each professional. There were yeah. a hundred of them or more, lots of them. And when I got my folder, I was thrilled because I thought, and I did actually, <clears throat> I did this a couple of times. Yeah. I said, "Wow." Adam Kubert's folder. <laughs> and I would open it up and look at some of the work Adam had done. And it was almost like being back in the office where you could see the work and be inspired by it. And then I found out that looking at other people's folders was strictly forbidden. Yeah. You were not supposed yeah. to do that yeah. at all. So I went, uh-oh. And of course, they can tell if you've looked. So uh, I quit doing that. And then not long after that, they rearranged it. So now... I can only see my own folder, yeah. whether I'm working for IUW or DC or Marvel, you know, you send this stuff in, you don't have access. And I, I'm sorry about that only because there was so much neat work, I'm sure, yeah. in all those folders. I would love to have gotten a look at a lot of it. But I think, I don't know if they were afraid that someone would get in there and, and damage the scans, do, you know, do mischief to vandalize some of the drawing. I don't know what the, the deal was in the modern world, you know, back in 30, 40 years ago, that probably wouldn't really been an issue. Now yeah. I'm not so sure, yeah. but, but I was very disappointed when I, cause at first I thought, Oh, it's the mother load of art. Yeah. <laughs> I'll be able to look at all this fabulous stuff. And then it was like, Oh no, you can't. <laughs> oh no. Yeah. So, so I didn't, but, uh, but I, I do miss not seeing the originals yeah um because that was so exciting yeah. at the time i understand the business has changed the world has changed i get it um and i like working at home i like being here in my own studio uh i can have a giant triceratops behind me yeah. but uh um but it's really um it's it's not as social as it was now for young guys now who do it now Again, conventions are only kind of beginning to start yeah. up in the States now. There haven't been many conventions for a while. There are some this year. Uh, Weezy and I are going to a couple. Okay. We'll see how that works. 
And that even that's like one of them's in June down in Charlotte, North Carolina. And even that's going to be dependent on what COVID is doing okay. by June. Because uh -huh. there are these waves that come through. And, you know, both we and I are older. Um, I would like to not catch it. I, mm -hmm. I, I suspect that sooner or later we will all have COVID yeah. at some point. Hopefully yeah. we'll all be vaccinated enough so that it won't be a serious illness and it won't do a lot of damage. But mm -hmm. you still want to be cautious. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, so we're going to do this convention. We'll see how it goes. I'm a little nervous about it. Okay. Um, I know Mike Mignola was here in town. I didn't see him, but he was here in New York okay. uh, at a convention this weekend, uh, a MOCA, which is, a, I guess, an independent uh, convention or co for independent comics uh, sponsored by the Society of Illustrators. And he was here for that. Um, so far as I know, he was fine. Yeah. I'll check okay. in again in a couple of weeks and see how he's <laughs> yeah. doing. Yeah. But uh, but there have been a few conventions and I haven't heard any really bad stories about them. So mm -hmm. it may be that, you know, we can have conventions safely. I know some conventions really, you have to prove you're vaccinated. You have to show proof of vaccination when you go in. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they check stuff. Um, one of the conventions in Baltimore last year, I wasn't there, but they set up a, um, uh, a tent or a little kiosk outdoors so if you were uh, bringing your kid in and your kid at the time was too young to be vaccinated, they could test you right there to see if you had COVID or not. So they would, they were very cautious about that. Uh, that was Mark Nathan and, and his crew who run Baltimore, the Baltimore convention. And uh, they were very cautious about that, which is good. So there are, you know, opening up some, we'll see how it goes. I got my fingers crossed. Um, yeah. it'd be nice to see some of my friends we haven't seen in two or three years now yeah. um, but it is you know it's kind of different so you got to kind of be careful about what you do and i you know the, i don't think either i don't know about dc marvel's you know closing their offices and kind of working out a new arrangement for how they have people in the office and it okay. won't be i don't think anything like they used to have so yeah. uh they'll just have to you know, it's a new world. You'll have to adjust. So what that means for young artists, I don't know. I don't know if you're young before you'd connect up at conventions, I presume, mm -hmm. or something like this on a Zoom call yeah. or on the web, um, which would be different from, you know, what we did when I was young. But uh, but I'm sure the younger guys will figure out some way to be social and to yeah. have friends and, to, you know, keep in touch. And yeah. uh, it'll just be differently done than it was when I was young. The conventions, it's a way to be social, right? Uh, mostly we that, that read comics, that is not a um, huge part of the society, right? So I, I think it's, it's, it's easier in the conventions, here in Brazil, the conventions is, it's backing now, but here it's not so good as USA, you know? So we want you in Brazil someday, but I think that we will be great in, I don't know, 2024. It's not now, you know, it's... I understand. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's going to take, it takes a while. Yeah. And, and, and the truth is, I don't like flying much anyway. So <laughs> I don't do very many conventions. <laughs> yeah. Okay, no, I, I buy you a boat. And, oh. and we, we I, I drive the boat. Oh, okay. And I bring you. <laughs> That I think it will be quickly. <laughs> so, Mr. Travis, uh, and you, you, I don't know if you told this, but you still draws in the paper, in the paper, or you do digital work? I am. I'm. A, I'm strictly a paper guy. Oh, nice. um, I've. I. I. I can't do much in the way of drawing with computers. I do a little. I have mm -hmm. plenty of friends who are digital artists. Yeah. Um, and some are, you know, not all the young guys. Brian Ballin. I think is oh, almost man. completely a digital artist these days and has been for a while, uh, for a long time, I think. Mm -hmm. now. Um, I haven't made that move. I just kind of like work on paper. Um, and so I, you know, I mean, I scan my stuff, I send it off, but I don't do much more than that. Um, one of the great, one of the things that, that Photoshop has allowed me to do, okay. most of my work still is lettered on the art. 
Now that's not always true. Their companies went through a period where they got everything ledgered, lettered digitally. Um, and if I've had some of my work lettered that way, but most of the stuff I'm in like Ragnarok uh, or a recent job for Marvel, they've let me get it lettered on the board. So John Workman, who's been my letterer since the late seventies is still lettering it. Well, John yeah. occasionally, rarely, makes typos yeah you'll misspell a word <laughs> i have to say with photoshop in the old days i would have to white out the word or white out the letter that was wrong uh -huh. usually it's one letter and then i would put it on a light box with the real letter showing through from john's own lettering okay. although that wasn't with the white out it wasn't always possible i sometimes i would just have to fake his letter forms now it's not very big i could do it but it was really it was hard to get it so it looked just like one of John's yeah. letters. Now, by the time it's reduced and printed on newsprint in a comic book, yeah. nobody's going to tell the difference. I couldn't tell the difference, yeah. but it was troublesome. However, with Photoshop, now I can grab another example of the letter L or whatever letter it is and paste it right into the word and clean yeah. it up. And I've done that, you know, or it makes it, I mean, it's a little like, it is like using atomic weapons to crack nuts. It's just really you know, this giant Photoshop machine yeah. and I'm changing a letter, which is really <laughs> But I can do that. That I've yeah. learned to do. That, so that's I'm, great. I'm happy about that one. That's great. And, and Mr. Samuelson, I want to play a game with you. It's in game. Uh -oh. it's in, in game okay. I, I create, I, I, know, I don't know if I create it. Uh, probably it exists, but okay. Uh, it's it's in, in a game. Um, I'm going to say some words and you answer with one word uh of what it means to you i i, I say for example okay. i will say uh, i don't know um, lamp and you have to say one word that what lamp means for you do, do you understand i guess i'll try it okay okay uh, it's but it's um uh the the mostly part it's um works that you made or something like that okay so i i will uh, the the stars slammers. I, I don't know if I'm pronouncing anything right, but star slammers. That's right. One word. Uh, okay. Well, almost say first. Okay, because first. it's almost the first. Well, it probably is the first regular comic. I mean, long story yeah. that I really wrote and drew. And had okay. dialogue in and all that stuff. So it's first. Okay, first. Thor. Uh, a blast. Okay, nice. Uh, Marvel. Um, favorite in the old days. Favorite, okay. Um, Jack Kirby. The King. <laughs> I know that's two words, but that's okay. King, the king. okay, or the, the king of comics. Yeah, the both uh, works right. Um, okay, that's it. Uh, and and I don't know, it's polemic, but I okay. Heroes Reborn. Mm -hmm. Oh, what I what was that? That thing Marvel did where they gave image some of the characters to do. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry, yeah, it was a long yeah. time ago. Yeah. That's um, Mm, I mostly I would say interesting. Interesting. It was okay. interesting. Okay. Let's see what they did with it. Yeah. And to finish, comics. Comics? Love. Love. Oh, that, that's beautiful. Okay. So okay, let's let's do to, to some questions. So uh I want to start to talking about Ragnarok, you your author of publication, and you what where did this this love for Nordic mythology came from, you know, uh, because you, you, you made Thor, that is an important thing to the comics and Ragnarok, you're clearly loving to do it. So when, when, you, when you did it, right? So. Um, you know, probably, it's hard to know for sure. Probably, well, several things that came together. Okay. One is, my grandparents, one of my pairs of grandparents is from Norway. They were immigrants yeah. to America back in the 1880s. So I have roots back, you know, I don't know them. Okay. I have roots back to Scandinavia. Um, I don't know that that makes a difference really. 
I don't go to a Norwegian flag day or anything that they do, whatever they have. Um, but there is that. Uh, also, when I was young, my parents, uh, my dad had uh, a modest library of books, the books he liked. Nice. And, and he had a pair of books that were mythological. Uh, one of them was Greek and Roman mytho mythology, yeah. and one was Norse mythology. And they were not for ch they were not for kids. They weren't like uh, juvenile books, but they were. I mean, I read them. Well, I read the Norse one especially, and it was a combination of prose. The author who wrote it, uh, Gruber, was her name, and um, she would quote the poetry from the scanning of the epics from the elder Edda, little okay. short quotes, three, four lines, um, tell the stories in quite a lot of detail. I don't know where all the detail came from. I'm not sure it was all yeah. in, the, in the poetry, but uh, it was fascinating. And of course, I think I was fascinated by the idea that in the Norse mythology, eventually the gods die. Yeah. It's not true in Greek mythology or Roman mythology or most mythologies, yeah. but there's this giant, calamity at the end of time where the gods and their enemies all fight in a giant battle and uh and everybody dies and of course yeah. when you're young and death is a long way off that's pretty cool yeah you get older maybe you think well maybe it's not as cool <laughs> but it's still actually pretty neat and the um i eventually went and found translations of the original poetry the elder Edda and the original prose, the young, the younger Edda, or the prose Edda and the uh, po poetic Edda, read them both. Read a couple of translations of the poetic Edda. Everybody has a little different take on it, but um, the story of the birth and death of the cosmos in the Viking terms, not a very long poem called Voluspa, which is really variously translated as the prophecies of the Sibyl. Although I think Sybil's a Greek word more than a Norse word, but the Vala, you might want to call it. Or the, the Vala are the wise women and, and uh, in the Norse. And it's not very long. It's really beautiful. Yeah. And it's very power. I find it very powerful. So, um, you know, I came across Norse mythology pretty early uh, when I was young yeah. and uh, loved it. And then when I was in college, I stumbled across Journey into Mystery 120, which was Thor from Marvel yeah. Comics. My next question is about this. What's that? My next question is about oh, this. Oh, okay. It's, it's so right I, on, I think on my the fact, that, the fact that they had Thor, even though he didn't have red hair, didn't have a goat chariot, he wasn't wearing iron gloves. I didn't care. I just okay. like, wow, it's Thor in a comic book. How <laughs> yeah. fabulous is that? Yeah. And of course, Thor wasn't as well known as he would be now, thanks yeah. to Marvel. But I got in early enough where I was I was delighted to find it. And they had kind of this pseudo-mythological yeah. stuff going on in the comic that was a lot of fun. And uh, so I just got more interested as time went by. But it, And I also got more interested in the actual myths and reading those stories. And, and so when I did the book, I tried to bring some of that work more into the comics or into the comics more than it had been previously. I didn't try and match the comics with the stories. I don't think, there's no point in that. I didn't try to change Thor's hair and make it red. I thought about it. I didn't do it, but I thought yeah. about it. Yeah. Um, but uh, it was really, you know, it was fun. And I thought it gave the book a different flavor from all the other comics that were out there. Yeah. You know, Wonder Woman has a certain amount of mythology behind it. But beyond that, not so much, not for major characters. So it gave, I thought, a different flavor to Thor, distinguished it from its, the other books that were out there. And then Ragnarok was just a, a kind of an outgrowth of my interest in Norse mythology, where I decided to, you know, do a deeper dive into that stuff yeah. and see if I could. And still, I'm not doing the straight myths. For one thing, if you want the straight myths, you can go to any bookstore. I'm sure this is true in Brazil too. And you can find the elder Edda or the younger Edda, or you can find books on Norse mythology, kids' books, adult books. Um, you can read those. So what I wanted to do was I wanted, what I did in, in Thor at Marvel, I wanted to use the Norse myths as yeah. a springboard into new stories. So there would be 
some familiarity and some relationship to the actual myths, but it wouldn't necessarily feel like you were just reading the original myths all over again. Mm -hmm. I didn't want it to be, have its own, a new flavor. Yeah, great. And, and, and when, you, when you talk this, when you talk about Thor and the, the comic book, uh, that, that's crazy, right? Because uh, as I said in this, when, I, when I was introducing you, uh, to me and to a lot of people, you were the most important person who made the, the Thor, you know? So that's very crazy. Think, think with me. Um, uh, I'm, I'm a young guy in 65, right? And I, I'm reading the comic book called Journey into Mystery with Thor number. 120. 120. 120. Okay. I read. Okay. Uh, I bought. Because, okay. 120. And 20 years later, you're writing and drawing um, what for much people is the Thor best to run. So that's crazy, right? Um, did, it was. Yeah, and, and, and I, I think it's beautiful if you see. And in that moment, did you did you know uh, what you was doing would be so big someday? Did, did this this no? I mean, you know, especially back in those days, eighty uh, three is when I began doing the book. Um, there weren't a lot of reprints. Okay. And before that, there were almost none. So really, what you expected, you expected the comic to come out, and disappear off the stands a week, a month later, the new comic would come in that would disappear off the stands a month later. And you could get back issues. By the time I was reading comics, in the mid sixties, there were guys in their mother's basements who had little ads of three point type and comic books of all the gazillions of comics you could buy for a buck or a buck and a half. Um, but uh, mostly comics came out and disappeared after a month. And unless you really went looking, uh, it was, you know, didn't, you didn't expect to go back and yeah. reread that stuff or see it again. It was kind of a one-time experience. I mean, if you bought them as I did, I saved them all from the time I began buying Marvel comics in 1965. Yeah. So I had them to go back and reread. Of course, now they're all so fragile that I, I don't dare open the covers. I'm afraid they're mm -hmm. all going to fall apart, yeah. but now they're all reprinted. Now they're available digitally online. Yeah, they're yeah. in reprint books. Okay. Um, but at the time, you really, well, there you go. This is the Brazilian edition. Uh, at the right? time, you really expected, you, did, you had no expectations that the work would have any kind of shelf life. You expected it to come out and disappear and be replaced by the next issue. Yeah. And that would come out, disappear, be replaced. So you weren't really doing this with the idea that I'm establishing my legacy because you didn't think it would be around long enough for that. Yeah. So... You just did it on a, you know, a month to month basis. I mean, I plotted Thor out fairly lengthily in advance. Um, the basic story, the basic original story that I told with Surter uh, was actually a story I'd put together when I was in college in geology. I'd, when I'd gotten into Marvel Comics, yeah. after two or three years, I was still wowed by Thor. I read all of them. I read everything Marvel put out, which back then was like, what, 11 or 12 titles. It wasn't so many titles. But I, Thor was my favorite. And so I put together my own story. Yeah. And in a sense, it was the story I told in the comic 14 years later. Um, I was in the office. You know, we were in the office all the time. Uh, Mark Grunwald was the editor of Thor. Mark was a friend. And I, th I think probably, I don't remember this for sure, but I'm almost certain. We would have talked, you know, we talked comics all the time. And we would have talked about Thor And I probably told him about the ideas, like what this idea I'd had for a big story and how that would work and yeah, stuff. Yeah. I'm sure he was interested in it. And so one day when I was in the office, Mark offered me Thor as the writer artist on the book in, six, in 83. And, you know, I was delighted. Now at the time, I was really a brand new writer. Yeah. I had written four issues of Battlestar Galactica Whoa. that I drew. I had written... Marvel's three-part adaptation of Indiana Jones. Uh, uh, what's the first Indiana Jones movie? I always forget. Um, the Raiders of the Lost Ark. Yeah, I, I don't know the, the name. It was their English. adaptation of Raiders of the Lost Ark. And I wrote a graphic novel of the Star Slammers that came out, 60 pages long. That was my entire fund of writing when I began doing Thor. So yeah. figure the Star Slammers is 60 pages. That's about three issues. 
Uh, Raiders is three issues. Other was four. So 10 issues. I'd written about 10 issues of comics when I got the gig to write Thor. And so uh, the good part about that was that Thor wasn't doing very well in terms of sales. So if the book tanked, people would just say, oh, well, the book tanked. Walt couldn't save it. Yeah. If the book did well, they'd say, wow, what a genius. So <laughs> they didn't quite say what a genius, but yeah. it did well. I was okay. Yeah. So I was still able to get work. So, um, but, uh, you know, that's really how I fell into Thor. Um, it was just kind of a growing interest over a number of years. And then finally accumulating in my being able to do the book at Marvel, which was great because it was my favorite book as a reader. I was delighted to be offered the chance to write and draw it professionally. Yeah. So today, looking looking back, you you understand your importance to this character, right? I I don't try not to think. I try not to think about that stuff too much. Yeah. I'm still a working guy in, in comic books. Just a guy doing comics. That's enough. Just I can still get work. Yeah. That's pretty good. And after that, I don't have much control over anything else that goes on. Yeah, that, 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 that's perfect because you, you, it's when, when you think that you're so huge in, in your, in what you do, I think that when you, you, you start to do it poorly, you know? Um, well, mostly what, what I would like is I would like to leave, if anything, a legacy of pretty good stories. Yeah. I won't yeah. say brilliant because I won't make that decision, but I would like the stories I write and draw to be good stories and be enjoyable yeah. and be read by people and enjoyed by people. And if they, if they find the work 20 years later and say, wow, this was brilliant. Who was yeah. this guy? That'll be okay too. No, oh, that's nice. That's nice. That's beautiful. Um, and, and during, 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 I, I don't know, pronunciate this, this word, but during your career, Uh, during you, is right during, during is fine. yeah it's because uh, my air it's i don't know i it, it don't out so during, you're doing great oh thank you so much sir. you know i can't speak portuguese or spanish <laughs> or anything else so yeah. you know <laughs> no, spanish. I, i admire those people who can speak a second or third or fourth language it's, trust me spanish it's very hard i i i i'm trying to learn right now i'm making this oh good for you this dueling so Uh, but man uh, it's so hard and, and it's a language that that seems like portuguese right but isn't it's very different and and i'm i don't know i, I think I, i will freak out i'm ah! uh, yeah that that's crazy just just study harder <laughs> yeah so um sir i will i will start harder so uh during your career uh, you created dozens of characters and which one Uh, do you think is the best and why it's better review go off you know uh i think the two characters i've had a hand in creating that are probably my favorites i don't know if that okay. makes them my best but they are my favorites bill is one of them okay just because he's an old friend um and i put a lot of work into creating him i i did a lot of thinking about uh what i wanted in the character about what his design should be like, um, what his backstory should be. I probably put more into Bill than any other character I've actually created, but I want him to be kind of a, a head, a lead guy in Thor for a few issues. So I needed to have him come out right. Uh, the other character really is Manhunter with Archie Goodwin. I mean, Archie, it was really Archie's idea to do Manhunter, um, but the way the, the character came out in the end was really a collaboration of the two of us. I did the design work on the character, um one of the drawings i did where he had a gun persuaded archie that maybe he should give him armor uh, arm uh, arms of some kind he hadn't originally thought of doing that um and so and yet archie wrote him so brilliantly that it was very inspiring for me to do that character even if it was only for a year yeah. so those two are my favorite characters are the ones i think i've had a hand in creating Yeah, perfect. And and about about Bill, did you did you read the better review that Daniel Warren Jones made? You know, I have not read the comic. I did a I did a variant cover for it. Yeah. Um, what I I'd like to, that one I'd actually like to read someday. I I think I probably the collection is probably out by now. I suppose. I I thought I would wait for the collection and I'll I'll pick up a copy somewhere. Um, mostly, I don't read books 
that I okay. used to do. Yeah, yeah. So I haven't really read Thor. You know, the, I mean, all the guys, Dan Jurgens and Michael J. Straczynski, all the guys that wrote it, all the really good artists like uh, John Romita Jr. who drew it. Um, a lot of really beautiful work. I've seen it. I haven't read it. Partly the Fantastic Four, and this is like a long time ago now, but mm -hmm. part of it is that once I've written the book, I sort of hear the characters' voices in my head. Yeah. And of course, when a new writer does it, those aren't the voices he's writing. Yeah. He's writing the voices he hears in his head, oh. which is fine. That's what they yeah. should be doing. But it makes it difficult for me sometimes yeah. to read something and not read it almost in tandem, where I read what they've written and I think about what I might have written. And so you get this kind of struggle just to set the stuff aside, set your he own head aside and read it as it is. So I have not read uh, most of the work, uh, books, the characters I used to do. Yeah. Um, I just don't go back to them. And I, and I will, these days I read very few comics. I look at comics occasionally. I look at the way the art looks or whatever, but I just, I, I mostly haven't read comics yeah really in some time but do you have an idea of what is happening on comics today or you you just i don't have any smile. idea uh, <laughs> okay i have no clue okay. um i've said elsewhere the business model of comics escapes me i mean i some of it i sort of understand but a, a few years ago uh, i was asked to draw beta ray bill fighting thor okay. for a variant cover and it, it, i think it appeared on a copy of Hawkeye. Now, it came okay. out when one of the Thor movies was coming, either the second or third movie. I don't remember which one. And so I think they were putting Thor on a lot of covers uh, to promote the movie or, or help sell the comics or whatever. Yeah. But when I got a cover of Beta Ray Bill fighting Thor, good drawing, Joe. It was a nice guy. It was a good cover. When I got that on the cover of Hawkeye, I said, all right, I don't really understand comics anymore. Yeah. I'm happy to cash the check, but yeah. really, I'll I'll just do the drawings. If I get asked to do drawings, if they're drawings I think I can do, I'm happy to do them. No, um, I, I did one recently, which, which was a blast to do. Um, Marvel, not Marvel, DC is doing a, I guess a sort of a dinosaur superhero book. I don't know how much is out there about it. I think mm -hmm. some is out there, but I don't want to spill any beans, so I won't say more than that. But it's like various DC characters as dinosaurs. Yeah. And I was asked if I would draw a cover, a variant cover for it. And so I did a variant cover of dinos of superheroes as dinosaurs. And I have to say it was a blast. Mm -hmm. I've seen some of the inside of the comic. I don't know the artist's name, artist or anchor, but it looked great. Mm -hmm. It looked like it looked like a lot of fun. I might actually read that. Oh, and I will say, let me jump back for a second. I say this every time I'm interviewed the one comic that i do read all the time is yasagi ojimbo by stan sakai okay. um i read that comic for the same reason i read comics 60 years ago 70 years ago which is it's fun it's got great characters it's yeah. characters i feel like spending time with not nice stories um some of them are funny stories some of them are humorous some of them are full of pathos stan really kind of covers a very broad range in his storytelling and yeah. I really enjoy it. And I like the historical background, the depth that Stan goes into to try and make the, the work reflect the feudal world of Japan in which these samurai exist. I know he puts a lot of time into it. Yeah. And I, I know very little about that stuff. Um, but you can see that, you know, it's kind of like Carl Barks on the Donald yeah. Duck work when, or yeah. Uncle Scrooge. Clearly a lot of love went into it, a lot of work, a lot of research. And you can see that in Stan stuff. And yet it doesn't weigh it down. It's not like you read this and you go, wow, what a lot of research. You yeah. read and go, wow, what a great story. Yeah. And you can go back later and go, oh man, he researched how sake is made. He researched all this other stuff. But when you read the story, you're just in the moment. And the yeah. stories yeah. are a lot of fun. So I, I, that's the one book I, I have on my subscription list at my local comic shop. And I go by there every so often pick up whatever I've got sitting there in the thing waiting for me. And then I come home, I read it immediately. Mostly Carl Barks, right? And he's, I, I, I think, nah, uh, I think he's the most, the most, uh, um, when you take some, some comic uh, of Donald Duck and you, you just having fun. 
And that's yep. beautiful. Yeah. They're really brilliant. And his, you know, Uncle Scrooge was his high adventure story. Yeah. Where he would hunt out the seven cities of Cibola or the flying Dutchman or whatever it was. And they were they were fighting the Beagle Boys. Yeah. They were great stories. So the Walt Disney Comics and Stories, which is the name of the comic here that had the Donald Duck stories, the Barks Donald Duck stories stories that was one of only two comics we ever had a subscription to in my household my brother and i would read it whenever it came in yeah um uncle scrooge we mostly bought on the newsstand and uh but we did buy it we could find it i mean back then no comic shops we didn't get to the mall very all, all that often so we didn't we didn't get every comic as it went by but we bought the ones we could afford and and read them and loved them so yeah and barks was it was the best yeah, perfect. So, sir, I, I'm here. I'm I'm coming to the couple last questions. So, be, since now I'm thanking you because I'm loving chatting with you. So, uh, okay, I think that is the most the most important question that I that I did because I I don't know I I, I was fan of your work, but when I saw this scene on a comic book. I, you know, I, I started to love your work. Um, okay, okay, let's go. Before the first crossover Marvel and DC, <laughs> Walt already has done this in a comic book. Uh, I, I don't know if it's on this edition, but uh, when Thor is on Earth, uh, he's not the Donald Blake, he's just Thor, mm -hmm. right? And he and he's walking, and then he crosses with Clark Kent. And I, uh, that's that's <laughs> genius I, i loved it so what okay marvel gave you total liberty to do that and how was the experience to do that you know it was it was fun it was at a time when you could do it now yeah. i don't think you could i don't think yeah. marvel would allow it dc certainly wouldn't allow it um and i kept it i mean i used one name i think clark is the one clark. name it gets used yeah, it didn't, lois's clark. name is not mentioned and You know, I gave him the gesture from the Christopher Reeve movies yeah. where he pushes his glasses back up on his nose. That's where that gesture came from, the Christopher Reeve movies. But that was at a time when nobody got bent out of shape by that stuff. I don't, yeah. you know, the lawyers might worry about it now, but really it was no threat to the trademark. It was no threat to the property. I, I didn't, I don't think I used it disrespectfully. Um, yeah. I just did it for, I did it for fun. I gave, you know, I gave Thor a pair of glasses. Um, You know, uh, Nick Fury, I think, makes a remark about, well, he's always worked that other guy, yeah. and but never mentions his name. Yeah. And yeah. I, I had a vision, my Here vision of Nick Fury. There you go. My vision of Nick Fury as a character at that time. And he was <laughs> he was only in the beginning of my strip, but I sort of felt that Nick knew everything. Yeah. That as the head of Shield, yeah, there just weren't any secrets that he didn't know. And at that time, it was possible to have a character like that who was altruistic. I, now we've all become pretty cynical. Uh, there have been a lot of comics that have been pretty cynical yeah. or, you know, that don't see altruism as a benefit. Um, and so I think you probably couldn't get away with that now. But at the time, it was possible. And at a time when you could believe in superheroes as altruistic beings. Yeah. Now they all have so many backstories and such crap that I'm not sure that's true either. But that was, uh, you know, that was the time and place for it. And I was glad I was able to do Nick Fury. It's like when Nick Fury knows who Thor is. You know, yeah. he picks up Donald Blake in the beginning of my first issue. Yeah. And he already knows that Donald yeah. Blake is Thor. Never yeah. has to explain why. It's just that he just knows everything. I, so that was a great Nick Fury. That was a fun Nick Fury to do, I have yeah. to say. And the yeah. fact that he, you know, I might have been inspired a little bit. I don't know. Um, John, John Byrne did one of his Superman books. I don't know if this was before. Maybe it was after I did mine. Uh, it was after history. the I, I don't know prizes, when his right? books came out. That might have been after my first issue of Thor. I don't 83, remember. Probably, you know, probably right? it was. He had a great line in one of his books, a line I just I totally loved, where it was in the, one of the first six issues of Superman, maybe one of the first, maybe the first one, where Superman, I think he's flying Lois Lane home. And and she says something along the lines of, you know where I live? Yeah. And he says essentially, Miss Lane, I'm Superman. I know where everybody lives. Yeah, yeah. I thought, wow. And if, now, the, yeah, the, in the, one context, and probably in a modern context, that'd be pretty creepy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. At the it time, is. it was Superman. Of course, he knows where everybody lives. 
and he's not going to use the knowledge for for evil yeah it's just it's superman the altruist but i thought that was such a great line and but i think it probably came out after mine so i guess i wasn't inspired by it but i loved it anyway uh, that's one of the lines i wish i had written yeah that that that's very nice I, I didn't know that. I, I will search for. So, uh, and oh, I, I would ask you something, but I, I sure. forgot it. Wait. Uh oh. What? Think I, fast. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I would ask a good question, but I don't remember now. Okay. I, I will remember someday. Someday I will remember. So, okay. you can drop me a line and I'll, I'll try and answer it for you. Yeah, no, that's perfect. So, um, Uh, the last question, I would ask you something, but okay, I forgot. So let's go to the last question. Okay. Um, and, and I think that is, it's not about your career, but uh, you work uh, a thousand times with Louise, right? Uh, and I, my, my question is, working family is easier than work with some random editor or something like that? Well, in some ways it is for us, although I haven't, I haven't had a lot of problems with editors really over my career. Yeah. And I've also worked, I mean, in some ways, the person I probably worked closest with as far as creating something from what they brought to the table, what I brought to the table was Archie on Manhunter. Archie was just so brilliant. We worked together so closely and I've worked with an awful lot of good writers since then. Yeah. And I, they will all excuse me for choosing Archie as my favorite guy to have worked with. And that's true with Wheezy. I mean, we've, we have worked very close together and we've worked, what's nice about it is we've worked in different capacities yeah. so that there have been times when Wheezy has been my editor when I was writing and drawing uh, Battlestar Galactica. There are times he's been my editor where I was the artist and David Michelin, he was writing Star Wars. Um, she's been my writing partner, or I've been her writing partner, yeah. on a book called Meltdown that was a Havoc Wolverine crossover that John J. Muth and Kent Williams painted uh, in a four-issue series, four prestige books, back about 89. Um, there we were writing it, and I will say we wrote it. One of us would be sitting there typing away, and eventually you just go, oh, I'm out of juice. And you <laughs> yeah. get up, the other person would come in and sit down and just start typing right in that same spot and just go with it. And at this point, I, neither one of us has any idea what Wheezy wrote or what I wrote. Now, we, you know, we try to make it all fit together anyway by the time we were done. But I wouldn't be able to tell you where, we, where one began or one ended and the other began. Uh -huh. um, so and then recently I had a chance to work with her again. I did two issues of X Factor and an issue of the new mutants that came out from a book here at marvel or here in the states called uh, x-men legends and we did issues three and four and issues issue 11 that was the new mutant story and the idea was that she the marvel had various writers like fabian and wheezy chris go back into their old stories from like 30 35 years ago yeah. find a place where you could put a new story into the old continuity And so that's what Weezy did. She went back and found a place in X Factor. It was right after I'd gotten off the book. It was, so my last issue was 39. Art Adams did 40 and 41. And these two issues fit in between 41 and 42. Okay. And then the, the New Mutants I'm not as familiar with. I'd never done a New Mutant story before, but I wanted to work with Weezy. And again, because we it's just so much fun to work with her. And also, it's so handy to have your writer living in the same house. Yeah. So when you have any questions, you just go, <laughs> hey, honey you know, upstairs <laughs> and, and get the answer, whatever you need. Yeah. So um, I've enjoyed working with her enormously and I'm, I'm very grateful to have the chance to do it again. I don't know how many chances we have left to do that stuff, but it was really, it was so much fun to, to do those books and do it with her. And uh, the, the new mutant story I particularly liked because it, I had a, it was like doing the X-Men Teen Titans all over again. It was a billion characters, even though it was only 20 pages long. Yeah. And uh, she helped me a lot. She, I, I put together, I don't think I have it handy. I'm not sure where it is. I got an accordion file with okay. like 18 file folder, 18 pockets in it. And every one of them was full of reference of each of the characters because all the new mutants change their costumes all the time. Yeah. So we had to find reference on what they look like at that stage of their careers. Yeah. So we did a lot of looking in the web for me, a lot of printing off on her pr printer upstairs and shoving this stuff in these 
envelopes so I could figure out what the hell people looked like when I was drawing them. And I probably still got some of them wrong, but it was it was challenging. Yeah. And it was really a lot of fun to try and get that stuff done That's right. Nice. That's nice. That's perfect. Sir, oh my God. I'm I'm very happy that you that you came. And I, I just want to ask you one more thing. That is okay. that you say to us what you're doing now, what you're what what comics that you're doing, but as you said on, on the start, you can talk a, a, a lot. Right. So well, I have I have two things. Well, three. One, I'm, I'm doing I took some commissions during the shutdown. Okay. I don't usually do commissions, uh, but but comics shut down for a while. It's like two years ago now. Mm -hmm. So I'm only cough, cough, cough doing the last <laughs> one. I should have gotten yeah. it done like a year ago. Uh, I took on about 14 or 15 commissions. Uh, I have one left to go. It's it's a huge drawing. So it's going to present some logistical problems and trying to figure out how to do it. I'm only getting I just got the paper yesterday. So it's a giant sheet of paper. And now I've got to figure out how to mount it and how to be able to work on it. And that's like the, my next problem. Um, and then I, I'm going to be doing, I don't think this is a secret. Uh, no, I'm not sure. <laughs> well, I'll say this much. Okay. Uh, and I don't think, I hope I'm not giving anything. I won't, I won't mention anybody's name or anything else, but I am doing a short story uh, with the hopes of raising some money for the Ukraine okay um friend of mine's putting together some stuff that's all i'll say about it and oh, i am doing great. i am well, i will say i'm doing it with some of my own characters yeah so having said that that's as much as i'm going to say i did just finish uh, a 10 page story that i wrote and drew marvel is they're coming up on an anniversary for thor okay. uh, in theory i have not counted the issues i have no idea but <laughs> okay. an issue of thor coming up is supposed to be number seven the 750th issue of thor maybe it is maybe it's i don't know okay it's going to be issue number 24 in the current run here in the united states and they have you're going to make a large a comic bigger than normal yeah and they've had dan jurgens has come back and written the story um jason aaron i think has come back and written the story oh, nice. they've gone back and they've asked some of the people who were associated with the book over the years to come back and contribute and so i've done a 10 page beta ray bill story, nice. um, which is now I've it's written, it's drawn, it's colored, it's lettered. Um, I don't know when the book's coming out. If you Google Thor 24, I'm sure it will tell you on the web. Uh -huh. Um, so that I just finished a couple of weeks ago. And once this big commission is done, um, I have a couple of small drawings to do for people, but not any big, nothing that will take any time. I expect to get back onto Ragnarok. I have a fourth story arc I want to do where Thor goes to Jotunheim and yeah. confronts the ice giants. Perfect. And that will be, there's some other stuff going on. I can't reveal it, yeah. but, uh, but that'll be the fourth story arc is Thor in Jotunheim uh, with the giants of yore. And uh, that'll probably take me at least a year to finish. Uh, yeah. I'm slower than I used to be. I'm more easily distracted. You know, I'm like a butterfly now. Yeah, right? yeah. Oh, look, a pretty color. I bet. <laughs> yeah. I just go off that direction. So sad. And and I don't have the tight deadlines. I mean, when I have tight deadlines. I can kind of get it done just in time. I, I've always had a very good sense of buckshot and when it's going to be right next to my ass and I can get stuff done in the last minute. But it makes my editors crazy and I don't blame them. So, uh, but I am going to be doing another another Ragnarok arc. I hope to do several more, but we'll see how that all works out. Um, but this one, definitely. And that's probably that's probably what I have online right now. I okay. do have I have one more variant cover I have to draw. I get asked to do variants every so often, and you know, often it's kind of fun just to do one drawing to do yeah. a cover. Um, you know, do the research, find the characters. Uh, the editors often send you the research you need. Um, one of the funny things about that years ago, maybe not to be so true now, but often you know there'd be some character I'm drawing and I have no idea what it looks like. So, or they've changed the costumes from in the last 30 years. Yeah. So they send me a, you know, a drawing of them, somebody's done. And frequently, maybe not now, none of my current editors, I hasten to say, <laughs> it'll show them from like mid thigh up. Okay. Which means I have no idea what his feet look like or what the <laughs> costume looks like around his feet. And it's like, no, no, I have to see the whole figure. Please send me the whole figure. Yeah. And then usually you can get it, but it sometimes it takes a while to kind of 
pull those things out of the companies <laughs> to get to look right. So you can see what the, you know, their boots look like or yeah. their high heels or whatever they're wearing. So, uh, and one of the characters, I, I won't say what I'm going to be doing, but one of the characters I have to draw, they did send me some reference and the character has changed numerous times over the years. Uh, I was there when the character was begun, but I have no idea what the character is like now. Yeah. So fortunately, after we finish talking, I'm going to go into my email and find the note from the editor and pull up the reference they sent me so I can figure out what does this person look like? Because I have no clue. Perfect, sir. Oh my God. I, I have to say, I'm here and I'm, I'm feeling like I'm in a good classes that I'm learning about comics and oh, <laughs> I'm, I'm very happy. Thank you so much for coming. And who wants to find you? You have your social media. Can you say your, your Facebook page? I have a, I, I have, there's a Facebook page. It's, it's really my only, my website per se. Yes. It's just called the official Walter Simonson page. Yes. So if you look it up on Facebook, you'll find it. Uh, it's set up so you can like it and then you can see all the content. Um, I have a personal page, just Walter yes. Simonson, but that one, I really only friend people I know on it. Yes. Um, what happened when I first got in Facebook, like 12 years ago, 10, 12 years ago, uh, I had one page. I friended everybody. Yeah. And in less than a year, the page was full. Okay. You only have 5,000 friends. <laughs> okay. And so now I friended like conventions and other professionals and friends and yeah. fans, anybody who wanted, I didn't know there was a limit. And so I went, uh Oh, I got to think about this. So what I did was I, I split the page. I created a new Walter Simonson page where I only friend people I actually know, or if I can figure out you're a professional in the field, I will friend you, but that that's not always easy to figure out. Um, but I also started the official Walter Simonson page. I run them more or less as mirror sites. Okay. All the drawings that are on my page, I have, I have do a couple dozen galleries. Um, I have drawings going back to about third grade on in, and the gal, one of the galleries yeah. is old stuff. And so it goes back a long way. Um, and then I have pages of covers, uh, or galleries of covers, galleries of pencils, galleries of ink. I mean, it's not, it's not strictly some drawings can go in any one of several galleries <laughs> yeah. I have to choose, but, um, but I have, a, I have hundreds of drawings up at this point, uh, going back to the really early days of my, of my drawing, let alone my career. So, and I put up new stuff. Sometimes I put up, well, recently, the last couple of days, um, I just got some artwork back. It was out at, uh, IDW. There was a star Wars, artist edition that came out uh, a mm -hmm. little while back yeah and the art has now all been returned to me and i was looking through it and there are several drawings i really like tom palmer did the inks on it did a really beautiful job saved my ass mm -hmm. like you can't believe yeah. it made me look good and it yeah. made it look like star wars and so i scanned a couple of those pages in the last four or five days and mm -hmm. put a couple of them up splash okay. page and a double page spread and so you know i may find some other stuff to do like that but I'll, I scan old stuff. I will scan some of the new stuff. I've got a cover I did for Marvel. Um, I did a variant cover. There, I, I think I can say this because I think the words out there, the image is not, I can't okay. show you the image, <laughs> but they're doing a, when I was doing the FF in the late eighties, I did a three part story that Art Adams drew. Okay. It was called the, the new Fantastic Four. We had four yeah. new characters. The old FF were kind of off in one corner somewhere in trouble. And the new FF were Spider-Man, Ghost Rider, the Hulk, and Wolverine. Oh, that's I just nice. did all the most popular characters. Yeah. It, was just, it was a good yeah, yeah. And the three issues came out. They sold really well. Marvel instantly put them in a book and reprinted the three issues. Yeah. So they're doing a new, I think it's a, I believe it's a mini series now that Peter David is writing. Oh, I don't nice. know who's drawing it, nice, but nice. they asked me if I would do a variant cover for it. Nice. So I've drawn a variant cover of the new FF and it was difficult to do for some reason, not quite sure why. It uh -huh. took me probably a week and a half. And I was not working out the whole time. I yeah. would work on it some and go, and then I'd quit and go off and play video games or I'd watch a baseball game or I'd do whatever. And then I'd come back and fight with it again. And then I'd go off and, and then I'd come back. And, and finally, I got it to where I'm reasonably happy with it. I thought it came out okay. Uh, there's still one part I'm still, uh, but it's not bad. I, I thought it worked out fine. And I haven't seen color on it yet. That's how new it is. 
I probably see color this week uh, on that one. Um, but you know, I like I like solving problems like that, trying to figure yeah. out some way to get at this and make it work. So that came out pretty well. Um, that was and that was pretty recent. So well, very recent. So yeah. I have one more cover. This giant commission which I'm sure I'll be putting up bits of it all over Facebook when I get around. Yeah. To it. Oh, and also speaking of the, of the social media, I do have a Twitter feed. Um, okay. uh, I think it's Walter dot Simonson five or something, or maybe that's Instagram. Okay. I can't remember. <laughs> if you Google, you know, hit Walter Simonson Instagram. I'm sure you'll be able to find it. Yeah. Um, I interact when I'm asked about stuff. I mostly, I just put up the pictures that I post on Facebook. I don't yeah. do a lot of other stuff. Um, I, you know, I've friended them or follow a few people, but mostly if I follow a lot, you know, the stuff just roars by at a high rate of speed. And I never, I can't keep track of that stuff. Yeah. I'm too old for that. So <laughs> I have a page. People can find it and see pictures of mine if they want to see them. And then I'm also, as of about a year, year and a half ago, I'm on Instagram. I do not understand Instagram at all. Uh-huh. Again, I put up the pictures I post on Facebook <laughs> yeah. um, and I put the captions up. And I'll answer occasional questions. I, I'm not big about typing on my phone. Yeah. My phone isn't very big. So I'm doing this, <laughs> trying to see the keys and get it typed. They're like, eh. So I don't leave long answers on Facebook. Okay. If, I mean, on uh, Instagram. If there's a long caption, it's because I picked it up from Facebook and dropped it in on Instagram. Yeah. So, but I am on those, I am on those three. Those are the only three places I am. Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. So you can find me there if you're interested. Thank you so much. Okay, that's great. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Simonson. And I have to thank you to thank to your dinosaur that it was here with us. So thank you. Uh, thank he'll, be, he'll appreciate it. Here, wait a second. I don't know if you'll be able to hear this. Wait a minute. Let me see if the batteries haven't run. Oh, God. <laughs> that's nice. Oh, that's It'll nice. go for about a minute. <laughs> <laughs> That's nice. Okay, so thank you, Dinosaur. Thank you, Mr. Simonson. You're you're the male here. So guys, thank you for every every one that watched it, and see you. Okay, and go in thank there. Thank you for thank you very much for having me. Oh, I greatly I, appreciate it. It's been I, a pleasure. I, the pleasure was all mine. Thank you, guys, and see you. All right.